Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And it's also good to see some familiar faces here. So what I'm going to share with you is some stories from the voyages, my voyages to the early universe. Well, historically, some voyages have captured a collective imagination. You know? Even today, we are fascinated by the expeditions of Lewis and Clark in 1804 and the discoveries that they made. We have also watched in amazement as Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon in 1969. And who hasn't followed Captain Kirk of the Starship Enterprise to go where no man has, to boldly go where no man has gone before? Well, today we study this cosmic frontier with instruments like the Hubble Space Telescope. But there is another frontier which is less obvious but no less exciting. That is my journey. My journey is to find out what the fundamental building blocks of this universe are and how they interact to make the universe work at the basic and the fundamental level. So, if you look at the structure in, the, in our universe, the galaxies, the stars, etc., they came about with matter which was formed about many billion years ago, right after the Big Bang. So let me take you to a journey backwards in time, 14 billion years ago, and a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. When I say I study the fundamental particles of matter, what I study is the state of matter a millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. By studying the state of matter or the behavior of matter at this time, we can figure out how the universe evolved in moments after its birth and made the world as it is in front of us at the moment. So what does matter to us? Most of us know about the atom, okay? What's an atom? An atom has a nucleus, lots of electrons around it. The nucleus has protons and neutrons around it. The protons and neutrons are made out of quarks. But what are quarks? Are they made out of something? Well, we don't know, and maybe that is the fundamental particle I'm looking for. Maybe not. I don't know. Well, how small is a quark, and how big is an atom? An atom is about a tenth of a billionth of a meter. How small is it? Well, you take a baseball, a Red Sox baseball, <laughs> and you blow it up to the size of the Earth. The atom is about 15 meters across. Now you take that atom and blow it up to the size of the Earth again. The nucleus is about a few kilometers, and in the nucleus there are lots of protons and neutrons packed in there. So a proton is about a tenth of a kilometer or so. But how small is a quark, which is inside the proton or the neutron? Well, we don't really know, but we think it's smaller than 10 centimeter in my Earth-sized model of the atom. In reality, it's smaller than a billionth of a billionth of a meter. OK, so uh, why is it that number? Well, that number, a billionth of a billionth of a meter, is because that's the resolution of our current instruments. It could be smaller than that, or it may have no size at all. We don't know. OK, so, well, what we know more about matter at this point of time is that they've, because of their properties, they fall into two major categories, quarks, and leptons. Quarks, well, physicists are qu quite quir quirky, so they give these names. Up and down quarks are the quarks which made up, make, make up the protons and the neutrons, and together with the electron, they make up the atom. So you, me, a bottle of water, this podium. For a particle physicist, they are only up and down quarks and electrons, nothing else whatsoever. <laughs> However, there's another stable particle around, which is the neutrino. It doesn't interact with anything, it doesn't bother us, and it has no electric charge. But then there are other particles which are around us, the photons, the W and Z bosons, the gluons, etc. There are lots of names here and symbols here. But what they do is, these particles help these quarks and leptons interact with each other and transmit the forces between them. But the story doesn't stop here. And actually, what we found out is that there are more quarks and more leptons. And these second set of quarks and leptons have the same properties as the first set of 
quarks and leptons, and are more massive, plus have even quirkier names like charm quark, strange quark, top quark, bottom quark, muon lepton, tau lepton, etc. So that's the periodic table for a particle physics. There are 12 particles, 12 antiparticles, and a few more extra particles, the messenger particle. But there is one key particle which you may have heard about. It's the Higgs boson, and that is a missing piece. We think it exists, and it plays a very um, major role in understanding one of the major clues uh, of physics. All these particles have masses. Okay? So the Higgs boson, we are trying to find out. We haven't found them yet. And if we find out, they will tell us the story of the masses of the particles. The electron, we all learned, has a given mass. But when we found the top quark in 1995 at Fermilab, me and my colleagues did that, well, we found out that the top quark was about 350,000 times more massive than an electron. Well, these are all fundamental particles with no size. So why is this disparity in masses? And all different quarks have different masses. So some are light, some are really heavy. Why? We don't know. If the electron mass was not the mass we, are, we have measured and a little bit different, then the size of the atom could be different. And then the universe could be probably different. We don't know. So this is a mystery we want to solve. And we think that, well, there are lots of uh, theories out there, but the, to make the long story short, we don't know for sure why these masses are different, but we have a hunch. And what we know now, or we think now, is that the Higgs boson is, or the Higgs field permeates the entire universe, so there are lots of Higgs bosons making, out, making up this field, and the particles which have smaller mass interact with it less, and the particles with larger mass interact with this field a lot. It's just like if I define all of you as the Higgs boson, then in this room, a Higgs field is created. And imagine that President Obama and I enter both from the back. What would happen? Well, I will be here faster in front of the room than President Obama would, because you all would want to shake hands with him than me, right? <laughs> That's what's happening. So that is what we think, how particles get mass with the interaction with the Higgs field, and that's the story the Higgs particle tells us if we find them. Now, the next story and the next particle which I am trying to solve with my colleagues around is the puzzle of dark matter. Well, all these particles I showed you earlier, we talked about earlier, only make up about 5% of our universe. Okay? There is a plenty more matter in the universe, but it's invisible to us. So we call it dark. It's our ignorance. Okay? So what, how do we know this actually dark matter in the universe? Well, it makes its presence felt to us by its gravitational interaction with the matter we know. It's gravity at work. The, also, it makes us known by looking at these galaxies, by the speed at which these galaxies are rotating. For these galaxies to not fly apart, there has to be more mass in these galaxies, which we don't see with our usual instruments. And so we think that there is this dark matter, which is the extra 25% of this matter, which we are trying to find. And we think that these dark matter particles are very massive. They don't interact with anything much. And they, we cannot see them through our usual telescopes, like the Hubble telescope. So my journey to the early universe is to really find the dark matter particle, and from the story of the dark matter particle, try to figure out how the large-scale structure of the universe uh, came to be the way it is around us. So, about 14 billion years ago, there was the Higgs boson, there was the dark matter particle, some other unknown particles, etc., out there, whizzing about. But today, they're not in front of us. So how do we see them? Well, we try to see them by creating a lot of energy in a tiny spot. Because Einstein told us this wonderful equation, E equals mc squared. I think these days even little kids know that, right? So what does that mean? Electron, no, sorry. Energy is mass, mass and energy is energy. So if you can create energy from there, you can create a very massive particle. So we create these energies in accelerators these days by propelling some particle like the proton to very, very high energies. And at those high energies, we can at least either see the substructure of these particles or new particles could be created. And that we 
called the energy frontier. And I am currently studying the energy frontier at the Large Hadron Collider. So this Large Hadron Collider is located at the border of Switzerland and France. It's a ring which is 27 kilometers long. And currently, as we speak, we are colliding proton beams, two proton beams headed towards each other, one going clockwise, other going counterclockwise in this accelerator, at, so that the energy which is produced in this collision, the fireball, is about 8,000 GeV, 8 trillion electron volts, or in other words, it's the 8,000 times the energy a single proton has. And that is a lot of energy which will give us a glimpse into the early universe. At least that's what we think right now. So here are protons, beams going towards each other. And this accelerator is quite a technological feat here. It is built out of about 9,600 magnets. Some of these magnets are colder than outer space. The vacuum in these magnets are better than the interplanetary uh, vacuum, and it is all 100 meters underground. And here what we see is the protons of the quarks basically heading towards each other. 100 billion protons in one pack coming from the left basically collide or meet with 100 billion protons in another pack head on in the middle of some camera detector producing these 8 trillion electron volts of energy, which is hotter than the sun currently, and produce these, and may probably produce these particles, the Higgs boson or the dark matter particle, or other unknown particles. And we take them, we record these uh, tracks of these massive particles or their pictures by our gigantic cameras. And this is my gigantic camera. Compared to yours, mine is 15 meters high, 22 meters long, weighs 12,500 tons, heavier than the Eiffel Tower, about the same as 75 747s. So, <laughs> and my competitive experiment, there's another one. But. They're competitors. So, um, the, the Large Hadron Collider is one of the biggest scientific instruments made by mankind. And it's not only a scientific achievement, but it's also a tribute to humanity. Because what we have, it shows us what we are capable of achieving when scientists and engineers from all over the world work together in sync, all across all borders. If the Higgs boson or the dark matter particle or some other particles I haven't spoken with, uh, tonight are found and they are actually there, then each one of them tell us a very different story about the universe. And my journey is to go to, to the early universe, is to go and listen to these stories each particle has to tell and then unravel the secrets of the universe from those stories. Thank you.